Tonight, super carriers are the queens of the sea, but what happens when you need to renovate them? Comcast, again. Then Brian Chi comes on to talk all about 3D printing. Padres Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Padres Corner is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streamed to your Roku, computer, or mobile device. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash PC and use the offer code PC30. This is Padres Corner, episode 23, recorded February 3rd, 2015. 3D with Chi. Welcome to Padres Corner. It's the Twitch show where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. Now, Padres Corner is a little strange. It's different than most of the shows on the Twit TV network. It's not specifically a tech show, but more a show for people who like tech. We get to talk about the stuff that falls through the cracks here at Twit TV. And as always, we're going to start off with some freaking engineering. Now, supercarriers, if you are at all into naval technologies, you know are the queens of the sea. They're absolutely huge. The largest being the Nimitz-class carrier, which is 333 meters long and displaces up to almost 106,000 metric tons. They're also fast. They're capable of steaming up to about 35 knots and above. It's sometimes classified, but they're expensive. The latest Gerald Ford class of carriers runs almost $13 billion dollars. And as we know, they're dangerous, with a dizzying array of defensive weapons and, again, in the case of the Ford, capable of carrying more than 75 aircraft and all their weapons, along with an electromagnetic catapult. And remember that carriers don't just, they don't operate alone. A carrier is always going to be surrounded by destroyers, frigates, and support craft that keep it safe and in the fight. Uh, they can be at sea almost indefinitely. The only thing that really limits them is food for the crew and expendables for the aircraft because all the power is generated by nuclear reactors. In the case of a Nimitz carrier, you've got four reactors. In the case of a carrier like the Ford, you've got two. And the clean water is generated by desalinizing seawater. But occasionally, even the queen of the seas is in need of an overhaul. Now, you think remodeling your home is different. Imagine trying to renovate something the size of a small city. That's what we got with this article from Wired, which I actually find absolutely fascinating. What they did was they followed the uh, the refit or the RCOH or refueling complex overhaul of the USS Abraham Lincoln. Uh, U.S. carriers are designed to last 50 years of service, but their reactors are far more efficient if uh, they're refueled halfway through their designated lifespan. Now, this involves cutting a huge hole in the side of the ship and removing the f fuel, which is then sent for reprocessing, and then they move in a new fuel assembly. Now, here's the thing. As long as there's that big hole in the side of the ship, why not take advantage of downtime and upgrade the parts of the ship that you normally can't get to? Now, again, talking about what we do, when we talk about upgrading our homes or upgrading our cars, we're thinking about replacing some wiring, maybe replacing that rotting wall, maybe moving in some new furniture, it's a little bit different when you're replacing something the size of downtown Manhattan. Now, when you, uh, when you refit the Abraham Lincoln, what you're going to be looking at is replacing just dozens and dozens of major components and thousands of smaller ones. Now, the Abraham Lincoln started their RCOH back in 2013, and uh, since 2001, there have been four Nimitz-class supercarriers that have completed that RCOH. The Abraham Lincoln will be repainted, the shafts and the propellers are going to be replaced. The watertight doors are being refitted. A 30-ton anchor was replaced with a donor anchor from the USS Enterprise, the uh, original nuclear-powered uh, supercarrier from the United States. And then the living quarters will be upgraded and retrofitted. Every pipe and conduit will be checked for wear and tear and replaced as needed. And then the reactors will be refueled, checked, and certified for operation. 
The RCOH is going to be completed in October of 2016 at the cost of several billion dollars, which is interesting because the next time you complain about the complexity of your next engineering task, just don't. Yeah, don't. Now, let's move on to something that uh, I, I didn't really want to cover. In fact, I've deliberately stayed away from stories like this for a while because people were starting to complain that I rant a bit too much about Comcast and net neutrality. So I'm going to call this one a mini rant. If you've been listening to the news in the last week, you've probably heard the latest Comtastic spectacular failure. And that was the fact that Comcast likes changing the names of their customers. Well, they made the headlines because there was a customer by the name of Ricardo Brown who just wanted to discontinue service for Comcast Cable. Well, the, he was transferred to a Comcast customer retention specialist, which were made famous by Ryan Block, who taped his conversation, in which the specialist used every trick in the book and every diversion and, and everything from bribery to cajoling to bullying and, and then outright just annoyance in order to keep someone as a customer, trying to keep them from cutting off service. In other words, they try to make it so painful for you to cancel your service that you just decide, it's not worth it, I'm just going to pay the bill. Well... There was this one customer who went all the way through the process, and for his pain, they changed the name on his invoice to Asshole Brown. A Comcast corporate has apologized, and they offered Ricardo Brown two years of free service, which is strange because that's pretty much just an extension of their customer retention policy that started this off in the first place. But it didn't end there. Since the announcement that uh, Comcast has made this change and and comcast corporate was really sorry and they were going to go look into the, the the reason why this happened in the first place more customers have stepped forward and shown that they had their names changed some of the favorite names were whore and dummy and and far worse of course this is just a regular part of the regular pr nightmare that is a typical day in the office of america's most hated company but there's something that I think is far more important and actually far more sinister than customer service retention reps being mean. You see, right now Comcast is embroiled in a battle. You've probably heard a little bit about this. They want to merge with Time Warner Cable. They want to become the largest services provider in the United States for Internet. Those two juggernauts together would basically blanket the United States, all the major populated areas, areas under the banner of one single company. In order to make this happen, they needed to prove to Congress that the American people actually wanted this. And surprisingly, Congress has been getting letters by the boatload from elected officials, from mayors, from city organizers, from senators saying, look, my jurisdiction loves Comcast. My jurisdiction loves the services that they receive. My jurisdiction wants Comcast to merge with Time Warner so we can have even better by golly service. Well, that's a great narrative. The problem is that it's all BS. Again, broken by The Verge, they found out that those letters of overflowing support were actually ghostwritten by PR reps from Comcast, sent over to the offices of these elected officials, signed, typically maybe with a sentence added to add their own personal flair, and then sent to the FCC. Now, there's nothing illegal about that. That actually happens all the time. Lobbyists will present bills before elected officials. It happens in Congress. It happens in the Senate. It happens pretty much on every level of governance that we have in the United States. But the problem here is that some of these elected officials are, are getting paybacks from Comcast. In fact, one of them, the one that's getting a lot of heat right now, is, is Secretary of State from Oregon, Kate Brown who has received about $10,000 in political donations to her, her re-election campaign. Now, again, it's not illegal, but as we all know, it's not isolated. We've seen this happen in Florida, Jupiter, Florida. We've ha seen this happen in cities all across the Midwest. We've seen this happen to elected officials who say that their constituents absolutely love Comcast, absolutely love Time Warner, absolutely love the level of service, who have not even polled their people as to how they feel about Comcast or the level of broadband penetration in their communities. This is a problem because this circumvents, it subverts the process of democracy. And specifically, it circumvents the future of the process of democracy. If democracy is fed by communication and the ability to voice your opinion and to hear the news the way that you want to hear it, then I see no bigger threat than a single corporate entity deciding 
that it's going to write for our congressmen, that it's going to be the fiat vote for the voice of the people and take over the internet. Now, that's just my mini rant. I think I need time to detox. Now, while I'm detoxing, let's talk about something nice. Let's talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that is IT training. Now, my first show here on the Twit TV network, where I came from, was this week in Enterprise Tech. It's a show dedicated to those people who want to know how the world is connected. We look at data centers and switches and, and the services that make modern communication life possible. But we get a lot of people who wonder, how do I get this service? How do I get into IT? How do I get the knowledge that I need to become an IT elite? Well, folks, there's now an easy way to do it. It's called IT Pro TV. Now, IT Pro TV is a video network dedicated exclusively to the world of information technology. Whether you're looking to jumpstart a career in IT or you're already working in the field, IT Pro TV supplements traditional learning methods in a fun and engaging way to maximize your learning and prepare you for certification. IT Pro TV offers hundreds of hours of content, with 30 hours being added each week. Their libraries include video courses on Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, A+, CCNA, MCSA, CISSP, PowerShell, and Linux Plus, covering topics like network security, Linux, Windows, OS 10 support for desktop servers, and more. But IT doesn't have to be boring. IT Pro TV hosts tell engaging stories and share personal experiences to increase your retention. Shows are streamed live and are available on demand worldwide to your Roku computer and mobile devices. Chromecast, too. And you can interact with hosts during the show with topic-specific web-based Q&As. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because, well, it is. You see, the folks behind IT Pro TV are fans of Twit. They have over 10 years of experience in IT and learning, and they were inspired by Leo to use the Twit model to help people learn. They use the same cameras, the same TriCaster, the same studio setup that we do. Oh, even if you're already studying with a book or enrolled in a certification course or technical degree program, this is a fantastic supplement to learn at your own pace and track your progress. Measure up practice exams are included with your subscription, as well as virtual machine sandbox lab environments for hands-on learning. Now, this is absolutely vital. This gives you a way, using an HTML5-enabled browser, to... Play with the equipment as if it was on your desk, on your workbench. You can use millions of dollars worth of lab gear without ever leaving the comfort of your own browser. You get all this for one low monthly price, which includes daily updates and features that are new every month. It's comparable to the cost of a study guide and much cheaper than going to an IT boot camp. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications recognized by employers today. Go to itpro.tv slash PC. You're going to get a free seven-day trial when you sign up using our offer code PC30, which will allow you to check out their courses, their live stream, and more. Subscriptions are normally $57 per month or $570 for the entire year, but we have a special offer because they're huge fans of Twit. If you sign up now and use the code PC30, you'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $3.99 for the entire year. And once you reach your 13th year, your for 13th month, they'll reduce your subscription rate even further, bringing your cost down to $24.95 per month or $2.49 for the entire year. That's itpro.tv slash PC and use the code PC30 to try it free for seven days and save 30%. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of Padres Corner. This is my favorite time of the show. It's when we get to take a guest and bring him or her on to Padres Corner. Uh, luckily, this next guest is someone who you should know if you watch Twit TV at all. It's Mr. Brian Chi. Cheever, thank you very much for coming on the Padres Corner. Hey, Padre. Boy, I tell you, those pictures from the Enterprise brought back lots of memories. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about this uh, because uh, we, we we brought you on specifically to talk about three D printing, but uh, you and I both have, uh, we'll say, a love. Uh, there's a, there's a love. There's a passion there for some of the big engineering that has gone into these ships. And you live in Hawaii with Pearl Harbor right next to you, so you've seen beautiful ships. In fact, you work on one right now, don't you? Yeah, I work on the RV Kilo Moana. It's a hundred eighty seven foot swath hull. And uh, it's kind of cool because I, I can be in 25-foot seas, put my coffee cup on the deck, and not spill a drop. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. We've we've uh, we've talked about that project on Twite, and I don't have any of the stills up, but I, I love hearing you describe this. You've put an observatory, <clears throat> how many miles down? Three miles down. What and, for? Well, well, I actually just I'm looking at one of the monitors on the side, and I actually saw a um, nudibranch swimming by at three miles underwater, which is kind of cool. But anyway, it's we're recycling an old AT&T uh, fiber optic cable. It's first generation. It's called Hall 4. And we brought it up. We cut it, put some special connectors on. And we have an unmanned observatory that's about the size of a VW Beetle. And we're measuring things like seismic activity. Uh, we've got several hydrophones, um, salinity, different types of chemical tests, and so forth. We can even hear the rain on the surface. Uh, we can hear earthquakes in Alaska. Uh, we actually, with the pressure sensors, actually saw a small um, tsunami go by. It was only, I think, three quarters of an inch, but we actually saw it as it went by, which is kind of fun. Uh, Brian, this is something that fascinates a lot of people uh, who haven't been paying attention to, uh, like, you know, big, high-end uh, IT. And that is how fiber is actually laid out over the oceans. Uh, <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, I actually still run into people who think that any time they're communicating with a different continent across the ocean, that we're going through satellite. And no, that, that doesn't happen. There's, can you describe the process of how fiber gets put down between, say, New York sure. and London? Well, first off, the fibers are never just on spools. There's actually a factory, uh, I believe, in Louisiana, where they actually manufacture the fiber... And the end of the assembly line is actually on the ship. In fact, there's um, not a whole lot of ships available that can do um, big oceans. The last time I um, actually had someone that told that knew about it said there's only four of them in the world that can do enough cable to span an ocean like the Atlantic or Pacific. And so the cable is made and actually spooled into the ship. It's wound in a very special way. Because as it's paying out the back end of the ship, it has to pay out at a certain speed. Otherwise, the cable will break. Um, so it'll actually pay out. And every um, 80 to 100 kilometers, there's this torpedo-like thing that's molded onto the cable that actually holds the, um, the repeaters. So there's power going down and, uh, you know, basic physics. Fiber optics doesn't care about uh, high voltage electricity, so it doesn't have any inductance. So you can actually run power with your communications. It runs the repeaters, boosts the signal, and then goes along the way. Now, the old cables, like what we're using, are more analog. It's, it's like a light pump. So we can't upgrade the speed. The newer um, systems, they don't regenerate by changing it to digital and back again. The new ones actually have... Uh, real light pumps. So even if you want to go and add more colors of light, it'll actually still repeat it. So you can extend the lifespan of these cables. And keep in mind, these cables are insanely expensive. Most of the time, no one's going to tell you how much they cost. But I actually had a person that designed one and she let, let loose that, yeah, there's a cable that goes from one of the northern islands of um, Japan. Yeah, and that's one of the cable ships. Uh, goes from the northern islands of Japan to Alaska, and that was a $4 billion cable. That's billion with a B. Uh, so most transoceanic cables are so expensive that no one country owns them. It's usually a consortium. So the group that I'm working with, we're actually trying to get one that lands in Rhode Island. It's called TAP-10, and we wanted to cut it and wrap it around the Titanic. Unfortunately, the consortium that owns the cable has disbanded and getting permission to take it over is not possible anymore. So we're waiting on the, the next consortium to retire TAT-11 and see if we can put cameras on the Titanic. It's, it's amazing that you could just abandon fiber. That Every time, I, when I was living in Hawaii and you were talking about these projects that involved abandoned fiber, I'm thinking, I would never abandon fiber. Are you kidding? How, how expensive it is to, to lay down fiber and you're just giving up on it. But as you said... It requires maintenance, and eventually you get to the point where it's it's actually cheaper to lay down new fiber, at, le yeah. at least for you know those transatlantic, mm -hmm. transpacific runs. Yep, 
Yeah, yeah. Now, some of these shorter runs, like across bays and so forth, those are typically picked up because you don't want to have a lot, you know, down there. Uh, and there is a movement to try and get corporations to pick up their old fiber so we don't have all these fiber um, laying around on the ocean floor degrading and possibly polluting the ocean. Right, right. Uh, when I, I was on a, uh, a cruise uh, over the summer to celebrate the uh, graduation of, of one of my Joseph brothers, and we actually happened to be right next to the berthing for one of those big ships. So this is one of the, the cable laying ships and the tender for it. Uh, and I, there was all four of them were actually there uh, on the other side of the ship. So it was amazing. I'm thinking this is like a multi-billion dollar fleet. And if you lose this, you actually lose the ability to easily lay fiber and communicate between countries. Uh, it's sometimes it's a little strange how fragile our communications uh, ecosystem actually is. Yeah, we're, you're actually looking at double digit billions in that picture. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. Let's go back to that. That's uh, so me doing the old. That's kind of expensive. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. a bit. Okay. Uh, Achiever, we we didn't come here to talk about fiber. We came here to talk specifically about 3D printing. And I wanted to bring you on because you've been playing a lot with 3D printing the last couple of months. Uh, could, could you explain really quickly what your interests are for 3D printing? Well, a lot of the samples that people keep putting out um, 3D printers, you know, they're making trinkets or keychains and stuff like that. This, and my attitude is no, 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 no. I need to be able to build things like custom bushings for my undersea observatories. I need to go and be able to build a, a gim custom gimbal mount so that I can bounce a laser off a drone and measure the chemical makeup of the water underneath it so we can go and find unexploded ordinances that were dumped off the Hawaiian shores after World War I and World War II. Um, 3D printing is finally getting past the toy stage. Um, people are starting to do serious things. So, like, for instance, this is a base for a, a spectrometer. Now, normally a spectrometer, where you go and stick a sample in and go and find out what the chemical makeup are, um, even a cheap one is about $7,000. The really good ones that are in laboratories are several hundred thousand dollars. The cool thing about this one is it's open source. We're giving it to the world. And all the parts, and you know, even the optics were, that we buy from Edmund Optical, so it's all commercial off the shelf, the entire thing with plastic is under $100. And um, The goal is to be able to go and provide spectrometry to even the poorest schools. Now, I want to take it a little further, and we want to go and see if we can afford some of the really big um, Z-Drive ones. So I can actually... There's one that's 15 feet tall that I'm really lusting after. And the cool thing is I can actually use that to 3D print an entire sea glider fairing in one shot. And while that doesn't sound real sexy, it's great because now I can go and put custom bubbles in it. I can put clear windows. I can do all kinds of things and keep the streamlining of the sea glider uh, but still be able to go put special instruments in there, like hydrophones, pH meters, uh, special types of temperature sensors and things like that. A lot of fun. And I desperately, desperately want the um, new electron beam uh, 3D printers to get less expensive so that eventually I can uh, 3D center titanium powder for pressure housings. I, actually, let's talk a little bit about that because sintering is one of these things that the people who are in the 3D space we just love uh, because when you're when you're doing 3D print the typical 3D printing. So what we would have is a print head that can squirt either PLS or ABS plastic or PLA or ABS plastic onto mm -hmm. some sort of surface and, and build it up layer by layer. That's one way to do it, but sintering can actually give you something that's incredibly strong. You're using a laser, a heat source, in order to be able to basically spot weld metal. Uh, but those those tend to be a, a bit more expensive, right? Yeah, they're, uh, well, they used to be up in the millions. Um, now they're getting down further and further. Uh, NASA is now using one, I think it's in the half million, three quarter million dollar range. They're actually uh, laser sintering bronze. Uh, their typical rocket nozzle for smaller rockets is about 65 parts typically. 
And it's a very precision machining and you got to put them all together in just the right way. And if you don't do it absolutely perfectly, you your rocket nozzle blows up. Well, the test they did was they actually 3D sintered a uh, bronze rocket nozzle in one piece. So already they saved a ton of money on material, machining, um, and so forth. But they were able to actually take that rocket nozzle up to 150% capacity with no cracks. Uh, so it could dramatically change the cost of getting payload into orbit. Right. You know, Chibert, when I hear people make justifications for 3D printers, what I hear a lot is fast prototyping. It's just this ability to take something off of a CAD diagram, turn it into a physical object, and then that object will later be discarded when you go to manufacture the real one. It strikes me that there's another use, and you're actually doing this, which is you're creating one-off parts. Mm -hmm. you know, something that you, you're not going to want to do a mass production run of it. You're, you're not going to want to spend a lot of money to get a super high-quality part. You just need something that works now and works well enough to get the job done, and then you can reprint it as needed. That's Actually, a little further, um, 3D printing is actually allowing us to print some stuff that can't be machined. Uh, things like being able to 3D print a bearing already sealed in the mount. Not possible with traditional machining. Uh, so 3D printing is going beyond just one-off. There's some new things that are coming out that can't be manufactured any other way. And that's what the Japanese and the Italians and the U.S. is doing up in the ISS. One of the reasons why there's a 3D printer up there is experimenting with 3D manufacturing processes in zero G, which just boggles the mind at what they might be able to do. And actually, we covered that, uh, that, that uh, ISS 3D printing story a while back on know-how. One of the amazing things was the bonds in zero G are actually stronger, not weaker. They were worried that without gravity to weigh it down to the tray, that the, the bonds would be weak and, and the parts would come apart. But as it turned out, the, the, the bonding between them was so much stronger that they had difficulty removing the part from the tray, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, we did not expect that. That's another frontier of 3D printing. Now, let, let's talk about 3D years of, of, of uh, 3D, 3D years, frontiers of 3D printing. Because in your experience, you've been, you've been playing with a MakerBot for a while now, you've run into a couple of difficulties, which I think are pretty indicative of, of people <laughs> who are just getting started in the hobby. Can you explain some of the things that you've had to deal with as you've gotten your, your uh, manufacturing plant online? Okay, so let's put this in perspective. With filament style printing, additive printing, your number one pain point, no matter what machine you're using, is going to be nozzle clogs. Now, on most machines, you'd think nothing about it. You'd just take it apart, you'd heat it up, you'd go and push some filament through to push out the blockage, and you put it all back together. MakerBot's fifth generation printers are very different. The printhead is not designed to be taken apart. In fact, MakerBot support will tell you we'll ship you another one. In fact, a lot of people are suggesting that you have multiple printheads because you are going to get a clog. In fact, I'm on my fourth printhead for my fifth gen uh, replicator. Now, I just found a um, company, uh, Fargo 3D Printing, that actually shows the procedure on how to clear the clog. And they actually sell new bronze nozzles uh, for about seven bucks. So I'm probably going to pick up a bunch of those. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to clear it. Um, yeah, there it is. And um, these guys have great tutorials online, shows you how to do things. In fact, I found a new hint from them just the other day. Instead of using blue tape, um, when I do that big spectrometer print, uh, it's such a big piece that it actually peels the blue tape off the glass and curves, and I don't get a flat surface anymore. So MakerBot told me to take the glass off wrap the blue tape around it so that it wouldn't pull up. Well, Fargo said, no, use gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape has a significantly more aggressive adhesive, so it will stay on the plate and not pull up, but it's still rough enough that you can actually, um, the PLA will actually stick to it. Great, great um, hint. These guys are selling pre-cut pieces, but you can buy some fairly large rolls of gaffer's tape fairly inexpensively from any audio, you know, audio visual store, B&H or someone like that. Um, 
works works great. Uh, and if you even need it stickier, they say just use some, some hairspray. You know, uh, you've actually hit the two biggest things that I've heard from people who are using 3D printers. Nozzle clogs are always the worst. Uh, and you have to maintain your nozzles in order to make it work all the time. And it's, in fact, that's basically why our, our 3D printer no longer exists here at the Brick House, because it could never print properly because of no nozzle clogs, but also because we couldn't calibrate it. Oh, the other part, uh, this is an interesting phenomenon. It, it only happens on some printers where as the head is moving back and forth, especially on the first layers that you, you put down, it can actually peel up the edges and you end up with these curled prints. Uh, and it's it's an absolute mess. And it, uh, the gaffer's tape clue is is fantastic. But we've actually got a little something, something we're going to be showing later on the show that maybe, just maybe, might be another solution. Uh, Achiever, uh, let me ask you this. So you're, you're getting way more experience with 3D printers than I am right now. One of the questions I hear most often is, I got my 3D printer. Now what do I do with it? There, there are there are businesses out there. In fact, we covered a few of them in CES who now connect their printers to an online store so that you can get designs. But the problem is still that people aren't maximizing the use of the 3D printer if they don't actually know how to create designs, how to how to modify things that they've received, or how to create something from scratch. What is that? Is that an issue for you, or are you using all pre-made designs? Well, first off, I'm going to fess up. I kind of cheat a little bit. We have a machine shop and they're very good at SolidWorks. Now, having said that, the spectrometer design was actually done in Google SketchUp. Not too tough. It's a, it's a very simple design that's consisting all of rectangles that you extrude. So that's that's what they call it. You actually take a divide, you take a shape and you extrude it to give it width. Um, so it was actually a very simple design. So SketchUp's a good way of doing it, especially since it exports .stl files, which almost every uh, 3D printer can handle. So the trick is the STL file goes into what's called a slicer, and the slicer goes and creates the layers. So in the slicer, you tell it um, how dense you want it. So like, for instance, um, the spectrometer build, I'm only doing a 20% fill. So the the spaces in between the solid layers, you know, I can actually tell it how many solid layers I want. Uh, it actually creates a honeycomb. Now, this is actually really, really cool, especially when you start talking about sintering, because now I can create very, very light objects that are very stiff and very, very strong. Um, kind of cool. Um, anyway, so one of the other things, too, is Photoshop CS um, Creative Cloud now supports 3D, and those tools are actually pretty decent. And AutoCAD is now giving away a free 3D um, tool that's also pretty decent. Uh, and then, of course, Windows 8 now has a way of taking um, files in and modifying. So if you want to customize it, put a name on it, uh, maybe make it bigger or smaller and so forth, those are all there. Um, not too tough. In fact, MakerBot's starting to release the same kind of tools for Android and iPads. So there's more and more tools and more and more places to learn them. There's lots of classes happening in makerspaces. Uh, more and more public libraries are starting to add this type of makerspace into their facility as more of a community service. Um, my big suggestion to anyone is go start in Google SketchUp. It's free, it's fairly easy, it's not hard to do. Uh, you can download an STL file from lots of different libraries and you go and modify it. Nice. Uh, Cheever, I, I want to continue this conversation, especially since you have access to far more manufacturing capacity and capabilities than most of us do. So I think your options are slightly better than ours. But uh, this is normally the part of the show where we uh, do a little bit of the tech. Are you okay with that? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do some tech. Achiever, this next piece is very appropriate because we brought you here for 3D printing. I, I was just at CES. I, I missed you. I wish, I wish you could have made it out. We're going to have to make this happen somehow next year. But uh, at CES, once you got away from the main show floor over to the Sands Innovation Pavilion, it was all about the 3D printing. I wanted to share 
some of my favorite booths, some of my favorite bits of technology with you. Uh, you, you feel like sticking around for a bit? About you nine minutes you. long. All right, let's do it. We've all seen 3D printing, but one of the missing elements has been making a 3D printer that works again and again and again. Well, that's a secret that the folks here at XYZ Printing have figured out. This printer right here, the DaVinci 1.0, is the hottest selling 3D printer on the planet. And you can currently buy this at Amazon, unlike a lot of other kits where you have to find some esoteric shop. Now, they've went from the DaVinci 1.0 to the DaVinci 2.0, which is a duo printer. It has two different heads, to this one, which is internet connected. So for those people who don't really want to have to design things, you can go through the internet to find the design you want to print. Now, if that's all that they had. XYZ would still be tops in my book, especially at that price point and at this quality. But they're increasing the state of the 3D printing arts by using this. This is the DaVinci 1.0 AIO, the all-in-one. This is a 3D scanner. That means that for those people who really don't want to have to design their own objects, you can put something into the scanning bed, it will take all the measurements, convert it into a standard format, and then you can 3D print it. Now, here's the best part. You could use this 3D scanner to take an object that you want to improve, scan it, modify it. Like, let's say you wanted to add a handle or a mounting post and then print it up on a 3D printer. That's real innovation because it means I can take the objects from my daily life and make them that much better. Now, they're not just going to sit back on their laurels with a great 3D printer and a great 3D scanner. They've decided that they need something that everyone can afford, that everyone can use. They wanted to leverage the experience they have in being one of the biggest electronics manufacturing firms on the planet and give you a product that's durable, easy to use, and, well, cheap enough for you to buy. And that's what this is. This is the Da Vinci Junior. This is a $349 3D printer. Now, it's not just that it's inexpensive, it's that it's durable. It comes in its own case, so it's gonna keep everything nice and clean. And the head is removable. If you ever jam, if you ever have a, a feed problem, you can actually remove the head from the assembly without having to disassemble the entire printer. That's entirely different than some of the 3D printers that we played with in the past. It also comes with a one-year warranty. If you tried to buy a one-year warranty on some of the other 3D printer bots, well, it would actually cost more than the DaVinci itself. Now, this is not just a $349 printer. It's a statement from XYZ saying, everybody come. Start with the DaVinci Junior. Start with the $349 printer. See if your hand is good at designing 3D objects. Then add a laser scanner. And if your skill progresses, why not go up to one of the big boys? Now, if you want to start in 3D art, you got to give a try to XYZ. printers are great in that it's a technology that allows you to create something out of what was previously just an idea. But most of them can print something like this. This is nice. It's a good size. It uses a bit of material, but sometimes you need something a bit bigger. And that's why I'm here with John Good from 3DP. John, this is about as large as 3D prints get, right? It's typical. That's correct. That's an, an average size. And uh, you've got something a bit bigger. Yes, something like 75 times bigger. Uh, are you going to show us what you got down here? Here's an example of a print off of the 3DP1000, which is a one meter by one meter by a half meter work area. So people are printing entire objects to scale. How big of an object can I create? Roughly three foot by three foot by almost two foot. And how quickly will that come together? I, I know one of the issues with some of the lower cost 3D printers is they'll take forever. I mean, it could take 24 hours to create something like this. Obviously, when you're dealing with something of that size, you're gonna need a bit more oomph. What does this do? The print time is a function of how dense the material or the object is. What I'm holding here in front of you would be roughly a 200 hour print. Now, the machine doesn't sleep. So uh, the good news is in about uh, seven days, you've got something that in terms of alternative ways to produce it, we're even more uh, longer in duration.
how much is this going to set me back? I know it's I know it's a little costly, but when you consider what you get, I know uh, it's going to be justified. Let me describe what you're looking at in front of you is less than twenty thousand dollars U.S. Now to compare that. A, a t similar size machine would be starting at $200,000 and up. So this is a huge step forward by leveraging open for materials, for some of the electronics, to go ahead and make large format affordable. We're back at the XYZ booth to show you off another piece of technology. Now, this is the Noble 1.0. It's a $1,499 printer. Now, you're probably saying, wait a minute. They had the Da Vinci for $349, and they're, they're larger printers for $600. Why would I want to pay $1,500 for this? Well, in a word, perfection. This is the granular kind of quality that you're going to get with this. And the reason why it does that is because it's a stereolithography machine. In other words, it doesn't use a printhead. It's using a series of lasers and this resin. It's a photosensitive resin to create the image. It slowly lifts the head out of the resin and it adds layers and layers and layers to the item. Uh, the finished product is this. You can get extremely small articles. You can get super fine detail. And it just means that you're going to get a part that's far more tolerant of, of really close precision movement. Uh, this is a different type of 3D printing. This is not squirting plastic onto a, a platform or onto a head. This is actually building the article from the ground up with laser light. Uh, if you are into more precise 3D printing, XYZ is making it cheap with the Noble. Now you knew that the Sands was going to be all about 3D printing. And of course, we've got to give you one more. I'm here at New Matter taking a look at the Mod T. And I've got Steve Shell who's going to tell me why this might be the printer for you. Steve, what is this? The Mod T is a consumer-ready 3D printer. We're going to enter the market this year at below $400. We print in PLA at 100 micron layer thickness, competitive with a lot of much more expensive printers on the market today. It's also Wi-Fi connected, which connects it directly to the New Matter store, where you can find designs to print, and with one click, send them into the Mod T to print. Now, that, that is huge, because there are a lot of people who will get a 3D printer, but then they don't really know what to do with it. I mean, you have to come up with a design. It's, it's not just simply saying print. If this connects to a store, it means I could find something that looks interesting and then watch my printer go. That's right, and we've really tightly integrated the New Matter store to the Mod T, so every design in there is curated, tested to print on this hardware, so you know it's gonna turn out right the first time, every time. I gotta ask, Steve, why do you have the platform moving? I know there are a lot of printers that have the head moving back and forth, forward and back, left and right. You've gone a different approach. You've got the head raising and lowering, but the platform is what does the moving. Why go with that design? That's exactly right, and there's a couple of reasons we do that. So number one, it's a really interesting patent-pending mechanism that reduces the number of parts required to move that platform around. And reducing part count makes it less expensive to manufacture, also makes it more reliable. Also, very interestingly, is it completely negates the need to level the bed, because the bed is moving while the extruder is stationary. There's never a problem with bed leveling. Tell me about the material. Tell me about what are the things I need to know before I get printing. All right, so the Mod T is a consumer-ready 3D printer. We print PLA, all right, it's a very household-friendly material. It doesn't give off nasty fumes or anything like that. Build envelope is six inches by four by five, large enough for your phone cases, a lot of the household objects. Layer resolution down to 100 microns, very competitive with a lot of other printers, and we print up to 80 millimeters per second. What do you think, Chebert? That was the best I saw at the Sands. Um, and does any of that strike a, a, a pang of desire? Well, the big one looks really interesting. Now, I, I, I do want to say, while it's currently vaporware, the product that looks like it's going to really rock my world is actually coming from HP. They're, they're taking some of the technology from their toner-based systems, combined with some of their inkjet um, technology, and they're getting into the 3D printer market. Now, they're going to be different. 
it's actually going to be layer, laying down powder and pigment and sealer in two passes. And most of the 3D printers out there have 100 micron resolution. This one's slated to have 50 micron resolution and full color objects. Wow. And they're going to be following the same kind of model they did with their, their, print, their other printers. The printer's going to be less expensive and they're going to make all their money on consumables because it will be proprietary cartridges, of course. You know, one of the printer 3D printer technologies that I've been looking at, and actually we're going to cover this in a future episode of Padre's Corner, is the Voxel. This thing, I, I, I don't know if it was at CES. I don't think so. I, I would have seen it. But it's a 3D printer with a little bit of a rub. So it does the standard plastics printing, but it can actually print electronics as well. So you can embed electronics within the plastic build. This, this is cool. This is something I could see you can't do with standard manufacturing practices. You can embed the electronics within the arm of a quadcopter or the body of an electronical device that you're trying to make. It's, it's things like that that really get me going because it's no longer just I'm doing something here that I can get someplace else. It's now I can't really get this anywhere, anywhere except what I'm doing right here on my desktop. Yep. And uh, to say that the world of 3D printing is going to change the world is an understatement. I've been predicting now for, I don't know, maybe the last five years that sooner or later the auto manufacturers are going to catch on. Right now, things like a plastic bumper or a rear view mirror for a car are insanely expensive because you're paying for warehousing, you're paying for shipping, you're paying for interest on the part stock. Why don't they just squirt around? You know, they can actually make revisions on the fly. The dealership should be able to just print you a new bumper or print you a new rear view mirror or print you this or that or a radio bezel. I had to buy a new bezel for my wife's um, Ford Explorer, and that cost me 150 bucks. for God's sakes. It should have been a 3D print. You know, that is what I'm really looking forward to. Uh, have you read the book uh, Demon and Freedom TM by Daniel Suarez? It's, it's a two-parter. <laughs> yes, I have. Oh, that's right. Actually, I introduced you to that. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> the, the audio book, and then you got the the uh, the uh, Kindle book. There's a There's a a central message in there about the removal, the destruction of the 10,000 mile long supply chain. And it's this idea that we live off of products that might be designed in one part of the world and they're manufactured 10,000 miles away and then they're brought over in ships. Where it would seem to be much better if you just had the ability to have the design and then create it locally. That's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I do see there's a transformative component to society when every local community can satisfy all the needs it has for parts, for components, for technology, without having to leave the boundaries of that community. It's, uh, it's, it's a very different way of looking at the world. Yeah, in fact, I just saw a press release from a company. <clears throat> I can actually buy um, 3D printer designs for nuts and bolts. Um, so if you have the capability of printing nylon or if you have the capability of printing in different materials... Um, they're actually selling a crown nut design for $23, but that design allows you to print as many of those nuts as you want. That's, you know, that's a disruptive technology. And um, being able to print on demand, you know, special fittings, being able to change the materials that they're made out of so I don't have to worry about dielectric processes happening, um, that's going to rock my world. Right, right. Uh, we have, uh, who is it? Uh, someone in the chat room is, oh, High Tech is, is joking around. He's saying, well, can it print bacon? And, you know, of course, that's, that's funny because 3D printers don't print food, right? Uh, except if he had actually watched our Twitch special, he would know that we did cover a 3D food printer. It was from the same company, XYZ, that did the Da Vinci. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to forward to it right now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what it means to, like, a state like Hawaii, where everything does have to come in over ships, to be able to look forward to once 3D printers have been able to, to do like laser sintering for, an, uh, for a reasonable price, what it means for you to be able to, to be self-sufficient? Oh, when was it? I think the last number I heard was something like 96% of everything has to be shipped in. You know, air freight is great, but it's limited. 
Um, being able to print means we can do a lot more things. Um, right now, you know, there's some things that I won't buy because the shipping costs more than the item. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, so you're eating some 3D printed food now. <laughs> Hershey's Corporation is actually doing some really interesting things with chocolate. So, for instance, if you have a special event, you want special chocolate favors and you want it done in your company logo. Currently, if you want that done, you'd have to get a custom mold machined and the mold's going to cost you about five to seven thousand dollars, depending on complexity. And then you have to commit to a production run of the mold. But if you can print on demand, you might start seeing specialty shops where you can have, you know, Valentine's messages printed out. You can have company logos. You can have the Eiffel Tower. Um, having all kinds of specialty things. So right now we've got these specialty dessert shops, you know, cupcakes and things like that. I foresee within maybe a year or two being able to 3D print chocolate. And wouldn't that be good for the girls out there? Right. You know, we're on this weird cusp where 3D printing is turning from a party favor. It's it's something it's it's right now it really is just something that geeks do because it's fun because we we see the promise in the technology, but we're on the cusp of it becoming something serious, something that as the technology improves, there's no longer going to be questions about well, but the quality isn't great or oh, but it takes 15 days for it to print. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of electronics like this and technological movements like this. Now that we've proven that there's a demand, now that we've proven that the concept works, it's only a matter of time before we figure out the process. Uh, I, I could say the same thing about drones. You know, drones right now are, uh, or I'm sorry for those people who hate when I use drones, multi-rotors, quadcopters, octocopters, septocopters, whatever, they're really in their infancy right now. And people see them as toys and they see them as something that people geek out with. But that kind of technology and the technology that goes into it holds huge promise for the future. And so it's the people who are jumping on right now who see mm -hmm. the promise, who I think are going to be able to turn it into something fantastic. Well, funny you should say that. I'm actually shopping right now for a tethered drone that I can keep up in the air indefinitely because what I want to do is on most research vessels, we need to be able to get up high. We have a crow's nest to be able to find out what's going on, where's the, where's the devices, uh, recovering buoys and so forth. But they're typically relatively short, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet up in the air. Wouldn't it be great if I could have a tethered drone that can stay up indefinitely running high definition video, LIDAR, thermal imaging and so forth, and be able to fly that up a couple hundred feet in the air above my research vessels so we can better find things. You know, if someone goes overboard, we can find someone faster, easier, uh, because we're up above the water. And that's the reason why you always combine an airplane or a helicopter with a search vessel in order to find someone. Well, for researchers, being able to get up high in the air means we can go and find out what's happening with ocean currents. So you combine that with all kinds of stuff. Like we're actually doing a research project now with stereo cameras so we can actually detect riptides on the ocean. Well, we have currents in the, in the deep ocean. Getting it up high enough means we might actually be able to see them and predict things like buoy drift, um, plankton drift, oil drift, um, all kinds of things. Drones are no longer toys. They're real serious research um, products. Um, the one that I'm actually looking at goes up 400 feet in the air and it's designed to go in the back of a Hummer and use it for border surveillance. So instead of having to put big towers up, it's an Israeli company, uh, they just fly this up in the air and they have a tilt pan and zoom camera and they can go and patrol their borders very easily, very quickly. I actually, I, I will admit, I did a project about three weeks ago. I used my, um, I have a 525 class octocopter. So it's one of those that has it's four arms. It has a motor on the top and the bottom. So it does push and pull. Uh, and the reason I do that is for, uh, for durability. If I lose a motor, it's not going to crash the quad. It just, it reduces throttle on the other three nacelles and it comes back down to earth. But the reason why I put it up was because I mounted a, uh, a, a, a very small two radio Zerus array. I had to strip it down to, to get under the weight. Uh, and then I hooked it up to a, uh, a GSM radio. And I just wanted to see what kind of reception I could get if I put this thing 400 feet in the air. 
Uh, and all the technology was was available for me. I was able to, to program an Arduino controller so that it would use GPS uh, and a barometer to maintain altitude and position. And it just knew to go up. It stayed up there for about 20 minutes, and then it came straight back down. And it's it, was, it wasn't a great test. I, I had a lot of technical difficulties on the wireless side. But at the same time, it was sort of like, wait a minute. I just put a radio station into the air at 400 feet for 20 minutes and I did it on a whim because the technology is now so available. And when you think about it, that's amazing. And that's the same kind of thing I see with 3D printing, which is people are going to poo-poo it and say, oh, well, it looks so weird or that looks so, we oh, so weak or that part's not great. But at the same time, it's like, wait a minute. I was just able to create this because I had an idea for something that might work. And even if it's not great, the fact that it's now a physical object that I can touch and I can use and put it into an assembly that's it kind of blows it blows my wig back cheaper oh yeah <clears throat> and oh just custom mounts uh the the mind boggles at what you can build and 3d print like one of the guys in chat room saying well what about being able to print wax uh for lost wax um molding yeah sure um there's a whole bunch of printers out there that can already do wax uh especially things like the simple bots and so forth where you can actually buy um a wax filament instead of uh, PLA, and you can go and 3D print your object and then coat it with ceramic and do lost wax casting. Uh, pretty neat stuff. Right, right. Uh, and uh, I actually did get to do some wax casting. Um, so it, so th I'm not sure if this is the same thing you're talking about, but I remember <laughs> I made a wax model uh, of the part that I needed, and it was buried in sand, and mm -hmm. then we we poured hot aluminum into the mold and it basically vaporized the wax and made mm -hmm. the aluminum into the exact shape that I needed. Very cool tech. Yep. Yeah, and it's not hard to melt aluminum cans anymore. No, uh, we showed that off on Know How. That's, that was amazing. I, I'll talk for a bit. I'm going to find that video because it is an awesome video. Yeah. Well, so like for instance, um, one of the things that I really need to be able to do is when we get uh, special fittings for underwater observatories or vehicles and so forth, a lot of times we have to make it out of polycarbonate. Now, getting, say, a latch uh, made in polycarbonate would put me back uh, maybe about 300 bucks in machining. Oh, and there it is. Um, but 3D printing it means I could probably print it for about five bucks. So that's pretty cool. So this particular foundry is does double duty as a flower pot and he's actually using an old fire extinguisher on uh, that he's cut up cut apart and that's the crucible so what he's doing now is he's just taking aluminum cans and melting it down that's simple charcoal briquettes and he's um creating the blast effect using a hair dryer and once he's got enough melted down he grabs it uh, with a set of pliers and pulls it pours it into his mold he's actually using um uh, baker's tins to as molds so you can make different things. So combine those two technologies to be able to do lost wax um, casting, and you can do some really, really interesting stuff. So I love this video. We are just, we're in a, a weird maker area. Really, th this is a great time to be a maker. Uh, if, if you're one of these people who just needs to tinker, uh, even if it's not where your educational background is, this is a great time to be alive. I mean, it's, it's, it really is. You have so many tools at your disposal. It's, it's almost kind of embarrassing. It, yeah, it's it's well, like, I, I should be out there. With everything I have going for me, I should be building stuff. Yeah, um, one of the guys that I work with said, hey, um, we heard about this thing about printing three-dimensional maps. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. that that'd be great. Because because we can run it in the slicer and just fill it with a honeycomb, I'm not going to use tons and tons and tons of plastic to print it. So I'll just go and say, well, maybe, you know, if it's going to be, say, six inches tall, tell it, okay, I want six layers in there. So I have six solid layers in between the honeycomb. So it'll be relatively strong, but still light. And I figure I could probably print um, three-dimensional models of the Hawaiian Islands. And if I were to have that custom made, say, with a uh, vacuum form, that would probably, I think the last time I heard of someone making one, that was about a $10,000 map. Uh, but now I can print it with a home 3D printer. Pretty cool. There we go. 
Chibert, I want to thank you for being back on Padres Corner. We got to have you back more often. It's just you know whenever you're on, it's a nice easy time of talking about whatever is geeky. Uh, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Of course, they're going to find you on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Right now, it's Mondays at 2.30 p.m., but starting in March, it's moving to 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. You're, you're one of my co-hosts, along with Curtis Franklin. Mm-hmm. And every week, we get together and just talk about what's the latest and the greatest in enterprise tech. But that's not all you do. Could you tell the folks where they find you? Oh, I also am a uh, senior editor with InfoWorld Magazine, and I'm a researcher at the University of Hawaii. In fact, if you want to play Peeping Tom and look at the fishies at three miles depth, you can go to aloha, A-L-O-H-A dot manoa, spelled M-A-N-O-A dot Hawaii dot edu. Follow the link to the live, and you can watch two webcams, one at 720p, one at 1080p. And you can also listen to The Whales Live. We have both recordings and live streaming audio. And that's actually going to be upgrading very, very soon. I am also ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab, on Twitter. And uh, I'm actually just shy of a 1,000 followers. And um, ought to be fun. So I like throwing all kinds of things out. And I'm doing shout out to Janisku. He was asking, can I 3D print a mic stand? The answer is yes, indeed. Uh, In fact, just the other day, I printed an adapter to go from a mic stand to a camera so that I could go and mount a GoPro anywhere I wanted. I've also printed um, clips to go on my mic stands to hold cables in place and uh, also some adapters so that I can go and screw multiple things into mic stands. So... It's kind of down to what is your imagination going to let you do. And as 3D printers become more and more inexpensive and more and more capable, I think we're going to start seeing some truly amazing things. And big shout out to the guys that actually have been designing um, 3D printed hands for those that don't have hands. Uh, There's this one guy that actually has made a uh, cybernetic hand using uh, raspberry, I think it was Arduinos and servo motors. And you're now looking at some video that was shot by Jason as we're putting down experiments. But that is at three miles depth, uh, 100 kilometers north of the island of Oahu. Oh, something, something we, I actually, let's do this really quickly. Uh, at that depth, there is such ridiculous pressure. How much, wait, what's the PSI at that depth? Uh, I can't remember the PSI, but it's 500 atmospheres. 500 atmospheres. Could uh, there was someone on your on your ship who would do something with styrofoam cups? Yeah, well, well he would take a star- large styrofoam cup, you know, like a Jamba Juice cup, and he would um, use markers and draw different pieces of artwork on it, and then we'll stick it in a net bag and send it down when we do water samples, and we'd come back up. Uh, about half the size of a shot glass. <laughs> Dr. Morbius did the calculations for us. That's 7,500 PSI. So, yeah, that, that has an effect on pretty much yeah. anything so, you send down. by the way, right now, shout out to my uh, legislators. Please fund our submarines. Deep dive submarines do not do well if you don't maintain them. Do you know what happens to the pilots if a submarine's not maintained well and you get a leak? They turn into strawberry jelly. Which is not great. No, no, that's uh, that's not. Let's let's avoid the jelly. Brian yeah. Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. My friend, uh, sir, we have to figure out something because the last time I came to Hawaii, I didn't even get to see you. Of course, I was acting as tour guide, so that's yep. my bad. But next time I come in, we're definitely going to go do something. When's the next time you're going to come into California? Uh, probably interop hot stage. Okay. If I'm actually invited, I you know. I'm told there's going to be a knock team. I uh, haven't gotten an invite. Um, I don't know in hot stages or anything, but if I'm invited, I'll be there and we'll do some more studio time. You can always stay at my place and we'll fly quadcopters. You didn't right do on. bad Hold- last time. You didn't do bad. Well, then. hey, I got to go buy my um, my CMOS and start learning. And besides, you know, I got to learn. I got to learn how to do it before I go and put up a uh, ten thousand dollar quadcopter. <laughs> octocopter with LiDAR, thermal imaging, and stereo cameras. Yeah, I, I would always suggest that you know how to fly before you put something yeah, that expensive. Yeah, especially since we're going to be flying it over live lava flows. 
yeah, there's not a whole lot of really good landing options there. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Brian G., the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory, one more time. Thank you for being on Padre's Corner. Brian, it's always good to see you. Have a good night. Bye, Padre. Uh, folks, that's the end of this episode of Padre's Corner, but uh, there's no reason to be sad because we're going to be back next week. In fact, this is a weird week for us because I do have to go away to do some priest stuff, which means we're going to be pre-recording a lot of episodes. We're recording one on Friday. This Friday, we're going to be with Flight Test, the guys from Flight Test. If you know anything about flying, be it multi-rotors or aircraft, the guys from Flight Test are some of the most knowledgeable, some of the funniest, and really some of the most personable people on the internet. So you're definitely going to want to stop by for that. On Saturday, we're going to be pre-filming two episodes of Padre's Corner for your enjoying pleasure. What The guests are still up for grabs, but uh, we've got some nice names. We just got to make sure that they can actually meet the schedule. Now, don't forget that if you miss any of our episodes, you can always find us at our show page. Just go to twit.tv slash Padre. You get to Padre's Corner, which gives you our entire back catalog along with the notes. So if there was a link from a story that you really want to know about, if there was some story that we covered, some technology that we discovered, some, some little bit of knowledge that you want to figure out more about, just drop by the show notes page and they'll be right there. Also, this is a good place for you to automatically subscribe so that you can get each and every episode of Padre's Corner onto your device of choice. Also, please follow me on Twitter. It's really the best way to communicate with me. If you want to suggest topics for new shows, which has happened, or if you want to have a guest for a new show, just follow me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And you'll also be able to find out what I do when I'm not on the Twit TV network. It's, it's uh, well, it's where I live on the interwebs. Also, I want to thank everyone here at the Brick House who makes this show possible. Also, uh, of course, to Lisa and to Leo for, for putting up with me and letting me keep the lights on. To Zach, my super editor, who stays here late in order to be able to put Padre's Corner out that very night. And don't forget that you can find me multiple times on the Twit TV network. Again, on Monday, 2.30s for now, for This Week in Enterprise Tech, Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. for now, for Padre's Corner, on Thursdays at 11 o'clock for Know How, and at 1.30 for now, for Coding 101. Check twit.tv slash cal to figure out all the schedule changes. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser. This is Padre's Corner, and you've come out sane on the other side.